Well, good afternoon. Glad you could join us. I'm Bill Martinez. For more information on the show, you can check it out, BillMartinezShow.com. Uh, our next guest has been a dear friend, uh, a mentor to me. He's put up with me <laughs> for over 15 years. I've asked him just uh, nonstop questions about Bible prophecy. And no doubt, Bill Salas has been anointed for a, such a time as this. God has revealed to him in so many ways um, the topic and elements of the prophetic that we know in part and that we can talk in part. It is like an onion skin experience, as Bill explains to me. And uh, we're blessed to have him with us uh, to share his expertise, to talk about the future war prophecies, Arab-Israeli war, Gog and Magog war, war in heaven, Armageddon, wars that you've heard about. And all leading up to it, we were told, Jesus himself said that there will be wars, there will be pestilence, there will be rumors of wars. You may not even be aware, but there's something like 32 wars and conflicts around the world at this very moment as we speak. I want to uh, introduce and bring on my good friend, uh, Bill Salas. He is the author of the new book, The Future War Prophecies, Arab-Israeli War, Gog of Magog War, War in Heaven, Armageddon, author of Now, Next, Last, Final, and the Millennium Prophecies. Bill Salas, welcome to the show. Good to have you with us. Hey, Bill, my good friend from 15 years back. How are you? Hey, I am so excited to have this time. And uh, again, uh, it is all with, with all due respect and humility uh, that I appreciate your mentorship and your patience with me to help me and our audience over the years understand what God is revealing to us. Well, you know, a third of the Bible, Bill, is devoted toward prediction, biblical prophecy. And we know, of course, several thousand verses have already been fulfilled, but there are still about a thousand left right. that are reserved for the end times these last days of which we are right deep, deep, deep into the end times line right now. Right, exactly. As Billy Graham said when he was asked if these were the last days, Bill, remember, he said these are the last of the last days. Right. And, and I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so here we are. These signs are being revealed to us. God is uh, batting a thousand percent with two thirds of biblical prophecy. Uh, as you say, uh, a, a thousand left. Uh, chances are that he's still going to keep batting a thousand percent because there is no God like our God who knows the end from the beginning and tells you in advance. I mean, what other God has man come up with that can predict and fulfill the future as Almighty God has, Bill? Correct. Matter of fact, the Bible, Isaiah says in chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, uh, this is where God puts his, his stamp of authority mm -hmm. on what he, what he is able to do. And it says, I am God and there is no other besides me, declaring the end from the beginning and things that have not yet come. Right. And I, my pleasure will stand. So basically, uh, he's saying that he, he is the only God. You know, so he, that's that. Matter of fact, that's what caught my attention. Uh, mm -hmm. Attending a Chuck Mister Bible study on the book of Revelation at a time when I didn't want to have anything to do with anything called God because of my past bad experiences with the spirit, spirituality and things. But uh, I, when I ha heard Chuck Mister talk about Bible prophecy and how it had all been fulfilled historically, 100% like you say, uh, I, I was I, the Lord got me that way. In other words, his ability to know the future really got my attention. And of course, I got very interested after 911 and what the Bible had to say about that that particular event, as well as what is so you know what is yet coming forthcoming and in the near future. Um, so, yeah, 100% but biblical prophecy got me sold on the Lord. And you mentioned Chuck Missler. Wow. I, I'm sure there's people that are watching, Bill, that hear that name. We miss him dearly. What a contribution to the body of Christ. I mean, here he is. I mean, this guy, this guy's a picking brainiac, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, goes, he goes back to the time, you know, starting around Hal Lindsey times. And yeah. at that time, there weren't as many prophecy teachers running around. Uh, the pulpits weren't really teaching much on prophecy, as is unfortunately still much the case today. But you know, him and Hal Lindsey sort of were pioneers in getting people excited about biblical prophecy. Well, and the thing is, like you said, 
you know, for those of us who had ears to hear and that God wanted us to hear, it really sealed us, didn't it? I mean, it hooked us in because you're realizing God Almighty, I mean, whatever idea you may have had, uh, you know, of God to that moment, and you realize here's the one who knows the end from the beginning. And he has said in advance what was going to happen. And when you read through the Old Testament, you, you see time and again where God said, hey, this is going to happen. It happens. Uh, and, and then you go, what other what other deity, you know, man-made deity or otherwise, has done the same? Nobody. Nothing has a track record like our God, do, do they? Exactly. And, you know, even Jesus Christ, he, he predicted that he would die. He predicted that he would race from the grave. And, you know, no, no other, a lot of people think, well, Jesus Christ was a great prophet or a great teacher. But he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody gets to the Father but through me. And so he predicted his death. He predicted his resurrection as well. Now, all the other teachers out there, uh, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, the Hindu yogis, they all left their teachings on this side of the door of death. But when they died, they never came back and resurrected exactly. to authenticate their teaching. So, uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And that's when I realized Bible prophecy was entirely connected to his testimony. We're told in Revelation 19.10, the spirit, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I, I said, okay, you're my God. You're my Savior. Yeah. Right, exactly. He is that chief cornerstone, Bill, you know, when you think about it. And he's also that cornerstone that he himself said that uh, man would trip over. They would stub their toes on it. It, it would be bothersome. And here we are all these many years uh, later, 2000 plus years later, and people still stub their toes, their knees, their heads on the chief cornerstone that is immovable. Yeah, and, and even in America now, people are looking for a political savior instead of drawing their attention to the savior, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen. But, you know, God is faithful, and uh, and there is an appointed time for all this, Bill, uh, an appointed time that we're not predicting. Even Jesus himself said only the Father knows. Uh, but he said, look at the signs, and the signs are quite evident. And, uh, you know, I, I always liked, and, and every time I say this, I, I hear uh Chuck Missler's voice in talking about the brothers Issachar and how they were students of the times, right? Exactly. And, you know, the reason God has issued prophecy to us in, in the Bible is not because he's wanting to show off, uh, not because he has too much time on his hands, not because he needs to impress himself or that he's forgetful. Oh, what did I say would happen in, through Ezekiel in the last days? No, he, he knows right. all. He gave it to us because he wants us to equip us for the days in which we live. Bible prophecy authenticates his sovereignty. I write about this in my Future War Prophecies book in the first chapter, why Bible prophecy is important. Isaiah 46, 9, we talked about, you know, God authenticates his sovereignty by knowing the end from the beginning. He's given us this information to inform us of what's the rough road ahead. Uh, it can, it can uh, spare lives. Like, for instance, Noah got advanced information a flood was coming. He built an ark. He saved the posterity of himself and his family. Joseph needed to know that there was seven years of famine coming, but it would be preceded by seven years of plenty. So he got busy with that information and moved forward. We have a lot of information we need to know about that we'll discover quite a bit in this program here that I put in the Future War Prophecies book that we need we need to be preparing for much like Noah did and Joseph did. Exactly. And Bill, uh, one more moment on uh, on the Father. Uh, what, what a true example of, of our Heavenly Father that doesn't leave us to our own devices, that doesn't participate in our lives. He is active in our lives and he gives us these signs and warnings so that we're prepared. Uh, an earthly father, what would an earthly father do? You know, uh, uh, most earthly fathers would be considerate of their children. They would, uh, you know, caution them. They would give them admonishment. And uh, our father in heaven, even more perfectly, is admonishing us and warning us of things to come, you know, for our security and our confidence that we uh, we can know that we know whose we are and uh, who we have faith in, right? Right, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the perfect Heavenly Father attribute. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have some loved ones in my family and sphere of friends and sphere of influence that I, I'm concerned that they're not believers. They will thus be left behind. I believe the rapture could happen 
really soon. We're seeing all the signs. It's an imminent event. There's no signs that have to precede it or prophecies to be fulfilled before it. And I think about that as I pray for these loved ones. I think, you know, these are your children, God. As much as I love them and care for them as an imperfect father, imperfect friend, how much more do you want them? That none would perish, but all would have everlasting life, John 3, 16, by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. So I, I rely a lot on the Heavenly Father in my prayers to just embrace those ones that I'm praying for and, and heal them, save them, and, and make them make himself real in front of them. Exactly. And the good news is, Bill, we hear testimonies all the time of people just like you and I who are praying for our loved ones. And, you know, prodigals are coming home. Uh, you know, these are the, and these are all part of the signs of the end times that people are turning back to God, that as this chaos continues to run uh, absolutely crazy in our culture, politically, otherwise, you know, uh, people not even knowing what a woman is anymore, uh, all, all this trans agenda, this exchange of, uh, you know, we're, we're going to, instead of worshiping almighty God, we're going to worship the God of climate, right? All this stuff God is in control of, he's not threatened by it. And uh, and it's up to us, those who are called by his name to remain faithful and and to pray, you know, our loved ones into the kingdom, right? Exactly, you know, Bill, these are very exciting times to be alive. I would, I'm so happy to be alive in this time frame on this timeline, mm -hmm. uh, even more so than if I would have been alive at the time of Jesus, you know, when he first came. Wow because god has given us so much information to know and like i said uh it's for our information to know to be equipped for the days in which we live uh but if i didn't know what i know if i didn't know the prophecies that are forthcoming what we see in the stage setting in the middle east with iran and syria and the war with israel versus syria etc i would be a bit fearful at this point in time so i very much encourage the viewers to um, read their Bibles and recognize that God is with them and for them and giving them information that they need to know. This generation, God gave them the information that they need to know. If, if they're not reading about it or hearing it at the pulpit, that's not God's fault. If that, those pastors are not getting the memo, well, that's not God's fault. So they need to get the memo and they need to be leading their, their congregations to the Lord through Bible right. prophecy. It's, it's an evangelical tool. Eschatology exactly. is an evangelical tool. That's how I came to know the Lord. Right. And this is why we must pray for our pastors, that they would be open and, and and hungry for what we call, Bill, the revelatory word of God. The Bible says my people perish for lack of vision. What, what that vision is, is the revelatory word of God. And uh, it takes a commitment and dedication uh, and covering because we know the evil one who has come to steal, kill, and destroy doesn't want they, he doesn't want pastors to have the revelatory word of God. And we know how Jesus presented the parable about how that word goes out and it looks for, and when it finds that, uh, that fertile soil, then that's when the exponential elements of God's mathematical equations come into play. And uh, it's, it's quite miraculous. Well, Bill Salas, um, how many future wars are coming and what is the potential sequential order, especially considering the fact that right now there's like some 32 wars or conflicts happening around the world right now. So help us understand what you're seeing and what God has revealed to you regarding the future wars. Yes. Well, in the book, I go through about 14 different war scenarios, major conflicts. And of course, these are, these are future wars. In other words, they have not yet happened. And, and since we're in the end times, these future wars will globally impact all, all of humanity. Even though a lot of them are centered in the Middle East, centered around Israel, right. um, end times prophecy is globally impacting. So it's very important for your viewers to know what these prophecies are. They're seeing the, the states being set for almost every one of them. You know, in 1948, Israel re became a nation again. After 1878 years in the diaspora, they were dispersed out of the nation in 70 AD when the Roman Empire uh, sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the Jewish temple, the second Jewish temple. And the, many prophecies have talked about the regathering of the Jews back into the land of Israel. And we saw that happen in 1948. And of course, immediately war started to happen in the Middle East, the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, the 1967 Six-Day War, 
with some of those Arab countries again. And then 1973, the Yom Kippur sneak attack and all those sort of things. So, you know, it's really important because right now, Bill, the things that are going on, especially in the Middle East with Iran's nuclear program that's developing rapidly, the fact that Syria has used chemical weapons and those chemical weapons are now being pushed by Iran's help into Lebanon, into Hezbollah's hands. Uh, Israel is very concerned about what's going on. They've been preparing for a multi-front war. In May of 2022, they did a drill called the Chariots of Fire. It was one of the biggest military drills of all times, and it was prepared, preparing to attack Iran's nuclear program and then expect to face off with the Iranian proxies like Hezbollah up to the north that has 150,000 missiles pointed directly at Israel. They've got a bank of targets. A lot of those missiles are precision guided. Syria used chemical weapons over 300 times in the revolution. Hamas, of course, has been firing missiles at Israel all the time. There are another proxy of Iran. You have the Islamic, Palestine, Islamic Jihad, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad now surfacing in the West Bank for internal terrorism. Uh, you have the Houthis down in the Yemen area below Saudi Arabia. They also say they can shoot precision guided missiles that can hit Tel Aviv. Then you have Shiite militias in Iraq as well. Israel is surrounded by exactly. enemies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing, and you and I have talked about this before, uh, would Israel do a preemptive strike against Iran? Um, you know, uh, going back to the days of uh, Obama, Biden, you know, Obama saying there was no way that he would ever let uh, Iran go nuclear. I mean, he says that out of one side of his mouth, but on the other side, he's uh, equipping them to do just that. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the leadership of uh, the IDF, knew that they had to do something. But uh, at that point in time, they really needed the cooperation of the United States in order to uh, employ some, you know, deep bunker busting bombs that you and I talked about then. But, you know, that was then. This is now. Benjamin Netanyahu was out for a bit. I believe God has brought him back in order to be that tip of the spear and to lead Israel against a uh, nuclear Iran. Is that fair to say, Bill? Uh, I believe so. 100 uh, percent. You know, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in his former days of prime minister, even during the time of George Bush, was warning even President George Bush at that time right. that Iran was the elephant in the room, that it was an existential threat to Israel. And even when Leon Panetta was the Secretary of Defense in, I think it was on 2012, he said Iran is going to get a nuclear weapon. And you know, at that time, he probably was estimating a couple months, but he thought Israel would strike back in 2012. And of course, we know Israel, Netanyahu became was taken out of the prime minister's box for a while, but now he's back. And, and I think what we're seeing, Daniel 2, verses 20 and 21 says, it's the Lord who changes times and seasons and removes and raises up kings. And he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those with understanding. So I think basically all the right leaders and all the wrong leaders are in the right places at this time. Well, uh, and as you say, uh, God's judgment will be throughout his creation. Uh, though we look at uh, Israel, and you and I talked about this, you know, going back 15 years ago, and I think you agreed with me when I said that when Israel became a nation, it was as if God's uh, hour hand on his prophetic clock was set. And what's been passing since are minutes and seconds flying by as we go headlong into the final chapter of the book of Revelations. Correct. You know, the super sign of the end times was often quoted as the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948, fulfilling numerous prophecies. But now the super sign of the end times is that all the end time signs are converging. There's no weapon that's not fashion, no national relationship that's not forming, no technology that's not developed that couldn't hasten the biblical prophecies to start happening soon and sequentially one right upon another. And when they happen, they'll be in rapid succession. Christ talked about birth pangs. In other words, you know, in the end times, exactly. in the tomorrow's, things will happen rapidly. So when a woman is giving birth, her contractions increase, they have more frequency, and you can't stop the process. So basically, right. that's what we're talking about here with these prophecies. Mm -hmm. Well, and as these wars, as they as they line up, you got the, the first war of Iran. Uh, you know, like Chuck Missler used to say, it's hard sometimes to, you know, track uh, with some of these names because you got to go back and understand when you talk about 
Iran, you're talking about Elam, right? And uh, that was his ancient, that was the ancient name of Iran and that's mentioned in the Bible. Uh, so uh, you've got to, uh, you know, you've got to be a student of the word and, uh, and, and do a little bit, uh, you know, more than a casual dive into what God is showing when he uh, points out these, uh, these wars. And as you enumerate uh, this first war of Iran. Yeah, actually, Iran has double jeopardy in the end times. They're the subject of dual end times prophecies. But matter of fact, if I think you have a slide number two with a map of Iran. If we can get that up on the screen, we can kind of put the viewer into the, you know, what we're talking about uh, with an image here. You know, Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 34 through 39, I read about as the first war with Iran. He wrote this prophecy around 596 B.C. Now, his contemporary Ezekiel, in his book, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 5, he talks about Persia. So when you see on the map up here on the image, Elam is in the peach-colored area. It hugs the Persian Gulf to the west side and northern west side of Iran. And the rest of the Iran on the modern-day map is Persia. Now, it's, this prophecy is dealing specifically with Elam, that territory by the Persian Gulf, which ha there's a nuclear reactor, as you see on the image there, that's Bushar 1. Russia's contracted with Iran to do Bashar 2 and Bashar 3. So with, by between now and probably 2006, there'll be three nuclear reactors right there in that hot spot. Now you this- think, uh, you, mean, you mean 2026, don't you? You said I'm sorry. Six, 2000, 2026, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, okay. All right. 2026, okay. excuse me. Okay. Also, also that area there is where Iran has its uh, underground missile silos and portable rocket launchers. And it's and anyone that's going to attack into Iran, let's say Israel does try to attack Iran at the heart of Iran in the Persia territory, former Persia, to take out Natanz or Fordo nuclear power plants, whether enriching uranium, they have to go through the Elam territory to do this in most cases. And they won't get through unless they deal with all those missile defense systems that they got there. Iran has a hypersonic sonic missile it can carry a nuclear warhead that travels at the speed to Israel of 400 seconds, which is 6.66 minutes. They also have uh, a plethora of high-tech rockets and missiles right there. There's an underground air base right there. So this is the area Israel have to penetrate through if they're the, the one that's going to fulfill the Jeremiah prophecy, which talks about, and I'll just summarize it in a nutshell. Jeremiah says that a time is going to come where the Lord is fiercely angry with Iran. And I believe that time is present at the now because I think, you know, we know Israel, Iran wants to wipe Israel off the map and, they've been, and they call them the little Satan. They call America the great Satan. Yeah, so yeah. I, it says that the Lord will be fiercely angry, but we find out why he's fiercely angry because it says that he's going to destroy from that area the kings and the princes because they want to launch something lethal somewhere. And it's, the Lord says, I will break the bow of Elam at the foremost of their might. So in other words, their ballistic missiles, hypersonic missile, missiles, it sounds like they're going to be dis disabled so that they right. can't launch these deadly missiles at Israel. At the time, it says when it's disaster, it says it'll bring about a disaster. And we're talking about a biblical disaster. And, and then it goes on to say that the indigenous population, the Elamites, Iranians today, affected by whatever this disaster is going to be, they will flee into the nations of the world. It says there'll be no nations where the outcasts of Elam don't go. And it also says that at the time of this disaster, that it'll be, they, Elam will be consumed by the sword, which is usually a biblical typology for war. It also says Iran's enemies, plural, will be dismayed when they see this disaster. Well, I'm not dismayed, but be awestruck. So we have, we have enemies around Iran. We have the international community's concern, Israel's concern. Even the Gulf Cooperation Council states to the you know, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, Qatar. They're also concerned about Iran's nuclear power programs. Even though Saudi Arabia is you know, trying to form an alliance with Iran, right. they're still concerned about Elam's nuclear program. Well, Bill, they understand. I mean... If God doesn't intervene on this, the human carnage, the calamity that would strike the Middle East is beyond anything that we could imagine, right? I mean, with that kind of firepower. Well, correct. And 
not just Iran now. This is why Israel is preparing for a multi-front war in their chariots of fire drill right. in May of 2022. And they were also preparing for a lot of ca casualties inside of uh, Israel at that time. In fact, one very interesting article I want to talk to you talk to you about here just for a moment. It says here, this came out in Israel National News on August 7th of this year. And it's a predicted scenario that 6,000 rockets at Israel would be launched during the first days of war with Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah, of course, is a proxy of Iran. Mm -hmm. 6,000 missiles a day. It says Israel's defense establishment is preparing for the worst case scenario during a war on the northern border. Now, we're still just talking about Hezbollah, not serious chemical weapons, not Hamas, exactly. not the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, just the concerns that could come against them from the north. And then what they're expecting will be days-long blackouts, hundreds dead and thousands wounded. And just a little sub-paragraph it had in there, within the first few days, about 6,000 rockets would be launched at the Jewish state. As time progresses, the number would decline to about 1,500 to 2,000. So phase two, a few days into it, they're going to taper it down. But these he says there'll be 1,500 to 2,000 effective rockets. And what they mean by that is not ones that fall indiscriminate, indiscriminately in, out in the field, or not ones that are taken out by the Iron Dome, the ones that will get through all that and will hit prime targets. And that's why they're concerned about the casualties. Now, in 2006, the summer of 2006, there was a 34-day conflict between Hezbollah and Israel. And it kept most of the northern Israelis in the north in the bomb shelters for that whole month period of time. At that time, though, Bill, the, is, Iran launched 4,000 missiles throughout the whole 34 days. Right. We're talking about 6,000 missiles coming in day one and day two. Wow. Wow. And, yeah. and those will be effective because the Iron Dome can't stop that. I was going to say, you're going to overwhelm the Iron Dome systems, aren't you? Exactly. And even Hamas has said recently, uh, an article in the Jerusalem Post that said that we can match Hezbollah by sending at least 1,000 missiles a day. Now, that would be coming from the southwest of Israel in the Gaza Strip area. Right. Uh, again, not to mention what Iran themselves would throw at Israel, not to mention what Syria would throw to Israel. Uh, a recent article came out that talked about Syria's chemical weapons being moved into Hezbollah's hands. So, and I remember when Syria first used their chemical weapons in the revolution, I think this was around 2013, mm -hmm. Israelis were standing in block long lines trying to get their gas masks. Exactly. And I believe most of them have gas masks. I don't think they've discarded those. Right. But Bill, we're, we're talking about not a cross town conflict. We're talking about a epic biblical war. And one of the chapters I talk about, in addition to the Elam chapter, I talk about the Israeli war with Syria Exactly, right. In Isaiah 17, I talk about the proxy war also involved. Of course, with Syria would be involved in that. So we're talking about once God allows these things to start happen, then it's just going to happen. It's going to be a domino effect. The prophecies are going to be uh, sequencing very powerfully one upon another. Right. And there we go, leading into, uh, of course, uh, your celebrated revelation of Psalm 83. Exactly. I think ultimately, if I were to lay this out sequentially, as I'm suspecting these prophecies will find fulfillment, and I could be wrong, but mm -hmm. I give supporting scriptures and reasons why I sequence certain things in certain orders in the future war prophecies book. But I think what's going to happen is Israel's going to hit Iran. They have no choice. They have to do it. They're preparing to do it. They continue to talk about it. Uh, they were talking about it back in 2012. They're talking about it more feverishly in 2023 at present. And I think what's going to happen is that's going to create a disaster in that area, and Iran will not sit by idly in that Elam territory. They will call upon their proxies. And Hezbollah, Syria, Hamas, those proxies we talked about, will be just bombarding Israel. And Israel will find itself in a prison rules fight. And they will have to take out a major city, and, for, and that will fulfill a prophecy in Isaiah 17. It talks about the destruction of Damascus, the oldest continuously inhabited city in recorded history, the capital city of Syria. It says, you'll see Damascus one night in Isaiah 17, verse 14, but in the morning he is gone, speaking of Damascus. And pronoun. Exactly. Yeah. And it says, this is a portion of those who rob us and plunder us. And Isaiah 17, 9 says, there'll be desolation in major Syrian cities, not just Damascus, that is caused by the children of Israel. Israeli Defense Forces. Now, some people try to say that the Assyrian Empire fulfilled the destruction of Damascus in uh, 
I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, 732 BC. I'm glad that came to me. I'm getting older now. <laughs> 732 BC. But uh, Isaiah talks about Syri Assyria or the Assyrian 41 times in his 66 chapters, but he never once mentions them in Isaiah 17. But we find that uh, we're told in verse 9, like I said, it's the children of Israel that caused the desolation. You know, Bill, inside of the book, uh, like I've not done with some of my other books, mm -hmm. I've, proved, I've put historical research together to show well, sound historical research to show that the, the Isaiah 17 prophecy has not found historical fulfillment. The Jeremiah 49 prophecy of Elam has not found historical fulfillment. Uh, I also point out that Psalm 83 is more than just a prayer, but it is a prophecy and it is a future war prophecy. It was not fulfilled in 1948, as some suspect. Mm -hmm. I go right. into great details in the book and the DVD on those topics. Exactly. Well, Bill, you know, uh, re referencing again what the Bible says, we know in part, we prophesy in part. In our age, we forget in part. So, it's, <laughs> you know, it just it just goes it goes along with it. But you know, it's not like we're trying to do any harm here. So, uh, you know, we're really trying to educate. And um, you know, as we say often on our show, is that you need to own your own knowledge. And hopefully what you're getting here from Bill Salas is some motivation to look into this yourself. Be a student of the times. Own this knowledge. Uh, don't have someone else just tell you about it because the fact of the matter is, is that the signs are there. And, and who's to know, Bill Salas, if, if uh, you know, again, God reveals his word at the appointed time with the appointed person, and you might be that missing link. You might be that puzzle piece uh, or that uh, particular sanctified individual that God has decided, hey, I'm going to drop this information, this critical information into your spirit, and it's up to you to be that watchman on the wall, to be that messenger uh, to his uh, his chosen people, right? Exactly. You know, I get kind of excited when I write a book, especially about some of these prophecies. I'm sort of the poster child for Psalm 83 and the Jeremiah 49 Elam prophecy. And when I when I issue these chapters and these books within these books, mm -hmm. I get excited when I get emails coming saying, hey, Bill, did you think about this particular detail? Could it mean this? And I, they keep in. So a lot of these people are enhancing what I've already been writing about. And I'm going, hey, that's great. That's a great thought. So like you say, everybody can play an important role. Uh, and understanding Bible prophecy. And another point, and we go back to Chuck Missler, I always used to say this whenever he talked. He said, don't believe what Chuck Missler says, or we'll say, don't believe what Bill Sala says in this instance, yeah. but be a Berean. Because in Acts 17, 11, it says that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they would search the scriptures daily to see if what they were hearing is so. And that's what we invite your viewers to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, Bill, uh, we, we touched on Psalm 83, and the future wars that are coming, uh, let's talk about the Gog Magog War from Ezekiel 38. Yeah, well, that's a really big deal. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that uh, God gets fiercely angry with Iran, in my estimation, and why he will employ the Israeli defense forces who exist in fulfillment of Bible prophecy to win wars significantly in, around their Arab neighbors in Psalm 83, not just Syria and mm -hmm. Lebanon, etc. Uh, so, one of the reasons God won't allow Iran to wipe Israel off the map or the Psalm 83 motive, verse 4, which has cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel can be rem remembered no more. There's, everybody wants to get Israel off the map. Well, God can't allow that to happen because we're told in Ezekiel 39, verse 7, and I'll talk about Ezekiel 38, but I want to lay this cornerstone verse out here. Okay. In Ezekiel 39, 7, it says, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. Right. They shall not profane my holy name anymore, and the nation shall know I'm the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. So there has to be an Israel. There have to be my people Israel, the Jews in that land, in order for God to fulfill that promise, which is really important because when he does fulfill that promise in Ezekiel 39, 7, it, it will put the world on official notice that he is the one true God. He is the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the promise-keeping God of Jesus Christ. So now going back to the this details of Ezekiel 38, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. A lot of your viewers are probably familiar with this prophecy. It is a marquee event of the end times, much like the rebirth of Israel was the marquee event of the end times. Ezekiel 38 verses 1 through 6 tell us who the belligerents are in this coalition that are going to come after Israel 
and they would include Russia. We believe that would be the, the leader of the coalition. There's nine members listed in entirety. Uh, you also have Turkey, Iran under the banner of Persia. We would go down the list and say some of the North African countries, Libya, uh, Tunisia, Ethiopia, perhaps Morocco. Some people even put Germany in there. Uh, some of the breakaway republics of the Soviet Union could be in there, some of the stands, the Kazakh stands, et cetera. Uh, we try to find the ancient names and map them up onto a modern day equivalent. But those are the general consensus of who they are. Then in verse uh, 7 through 13, we find out the motive of Russia's invasion. It says the leader of Russia gets an evil plan to come to invade Israel for plunder and great spoil. Uh, at a time, it says in the latter years, so this prophecy was reserved for this point on the timeline. And it invades in Israel that is dwelling securely, the walls, bars, nor gates, and it is in receipt of this great plunder. And that Israel, in my estimation, does not exist just yet. I call this a next prophecy, meaning it's got a few preconditions. Uh -huh. In fact, can we take a moment and put up slide one so I can kind of explain what I mean by the next prophecies, if you've got it there? Okay, you can see I, I've written a Here to Eternity series book and DVD, mm -hmm. five books, five DVDs. The now prophecies we've been talking about some now prophecies, Elam, Damascus, Psalm 83. Uh, these could happen at the present time. They lack preconditions. They could happen now. The next prophecies, which was book two that came out in 2018, they are stage setting prophecies, but they have a few preconditions like Ezekiel 38. Israel has to be dwelling securely without walls, bars, nor gates. They've got a 403 mile wall, partition wall uh, running down the heart of Israel that keeps out Palestinian terrorism. They got border walls along with the north with keep Hezbollah out of Israel. They've got walls on the border with Jordan. They've got walls on the border going down into the Sinai and the Negev. Uh, they've got fences all around you know, the Gaza Strip and the Palestinian areas. So they're not dwelling securely without walls, bars, nor gates. Now, after the prophecies we talked about, Elam, destruction of Damascus, desolation of Syrian cities, Psalm 83, those walls can come down and they will come down. Mm -hmm. And Israel is, is already developing wealth. They just recently came out with 23% more gas profits out of their natural gas that they're developing out in the Mediterranean news article just today. So they're already developing great wealth within the country. So uh, Ezekiel 38, back to it. Be, Russia's going to be coming after a safe dwelling Israel for the plunder and booty. And in Ezekiel 38, verses 14, all the way through to Ezekiel 39, verse 6, we're told how God is going to deal with this, this confrontation, the most massive armed and dangerous Middle East invasion of all time, coming into Israel from the mountains of, up from the mountains to the north and the uttermost parts of the north, they'll be coming down with about two and a half million troops. If this was to happen today, the potential for troops, troops would be about two and a half million versus Israel, who's got about 176,000 troops. So right. God has to intervene. And we're, 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 back, we're back to the six day war odds again. <laughs> exactly, and God, America is not gonna intervene because we're not listed as helping is, is God or Israel fight that war. Israel is not fighting that war. They will have fought the wars of Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17, but not necessarily, they're not going to be involved in fighting this war because God's going, to, God's going to step in. He's going to roll his sleeves up and says what he's going to do. And the world will be watching this. Now, the church may not be here for this. I personally think we may be raptured prior, but we could be here because I believe it's a pre-tribulation prophecy. I don't believe the church will go through the tribulation. So we're, we're, the rapture, I believe, is a pre-tribulation event. But I think Ezekiel 38, Psalm 83, Jeremiah 49, the Elam prophecy, Isaiah 17, I believe those are also pre-tribulation. And the one that comes after those other ones is Ezekiel 38. And God will stop that. He's going to create a great, huge earthquake. And that great earthquake is going to panic all the soldiers because it says every man's sword will turn against his brother. Now, remember, these are countries coming down into Israel with foreign, they all speak foreign languages. Their ability to communicate is not good. They're going to panic. They're going to start killing one another. Then it goes on to say the Lord will shed flooding rains, great hailstones, fire and brimstone, and that's going to wipe out those troops. And the world's going to see that and they're going to go back, whoa, that was the God of the Jews that did that. Exactly. And that's when and that's what it says in Ezekiel 39 7, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I quoted that verse earlier. And then what happens after that, we're given so much detail. You, you look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, take it very literally, because it's, I think God wants us to understand all the details about this prophecy. We don't need to allegorize 
any part of this prophecy. And it gets into Ezekiel 39, verses 8, on through to the rest of it. And it talks about the mop up. It says they're going to be burying the dead for seven months exactly. in a valley of Hamangog, which doesn't exist today, but it's going to be a valley east of some sea in a valley that obstructs travelers. I personally believe that that will be actually in central Jordan. Israel will have possession of Jordan by that time. I put that in my future war of prophecies book. I believe they're going to bury him there. And uh, it also then goes on to say they will be converting the weapons to fuel for seven years. Uh, and Israel has that technology right now. Even America has the technology to take nuclear weapons and turn them into fuel. I believe that the Russian invaders are going to bring all their best weapons on the shelf, uh, atomic, biological, chemical. I think they're all coming down toward Israel's God's going to stop them in their track. They're going to bury the dead for seven months. They're going to convert the fuel for seven years, which is one of the reasons, Bill, a lot of us like Dr. Ron Rose, Dr. Reagan, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and many more uh, believe that this pre this is a pre-tribulation war because when you're burning weapons, converting them to fuel for seven years, you can do that three and a half years before the tribulation. You can do them three and a half years in the first half of the seven-year tribulation because at that time, Israel is living in peace. Right. They can burn their covenant. It's a pseudo peace because at the midpoint of the tribulation, it's going to get broken when the Antichrist goes into their third Jewish temple, which is about to be built. And he does the abomination of desolation. And even Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 15, when you see that act, the abomination of desolation, the Jews need to flee. And that's exactly. the point. The second half of the tribulation, the Jews will be fleeing because the Antichrist will attempt a genocidal att attack on the Jewish people. So they'll be fleeing. And if anything, they will pick up a weapon to use it to defend themselves. They won't have time in their haste to get out of there. To well, that's 144,000 Jews heading to the hills, right? Well, 144,000 are uh, coming in Revelation chapter 7. After the rapture, they're God's instrument of evangelism. They're mm -hmm. from the 12, 12 tribes of Israel. Exactly. And they'll be on the scene at that time. And I'm talking about the Jews in general who will be living in Israel. They'll probably oh, be at that oh, time. Right. I think there's 7, billion or, 7 million or so presently. Mm -hmm. uh, that number after Psalm 83 and when Israel's tearing down walls and can dwell more securely, I believe that that's going to go up a few more million by that time. By the time the tribulation happens, if there's not 10 million Jews living in Israel, I'll be shocked. And Zechariah 13, 8 says that two-thirds of the Jews will be cut off, they'll be killed, but one-third will pull through. So we're talking probably two or three million Jews will be fleeing. They'll be fleeing to southern Jordan in a place called Petra. I pinpoint that, yeah, right. why we can believe that inside my book. And they're going to be fleeing to go there. Uh, and so they won't be burning weapons. So therefore, the Ezekiel 38, in my estimation, must conclude at least three and a half years before the tribulation. That's in yeah, that makes sense. Bill, we got about uh, seven minutes left here. Uh, number one question, we always hear at Prophecy Conference, where is America? You already pointed out, America won't be in, uh, in these conflicts because this will be the almighty hand of God. Well, it's interesting because I personally think America is listed in Bible prophecy in one place. And I, I put that in the book, and I put that in the Future Wars DVD. And I give historical, biblical, archaeological, and geopolitical and geographical reasons that I believe Ezekiel 38, the verses, chapter th verses 13 of Ezekiel 38, I believe were there. And, and it, what it says there is that the uh, Sheba and Dedan, which Sheba would be um, Yemen, Dedan would be Saudi Arabia, the merchants of Tarshish, which I believe is the UK, and their young lions, which I believe would include America. Right. Uh, I'm standing on the sidelines. They're not helping Israel. They're not invading Israel, which is good. But they're standing on the sidelines saying to the Russian coalition, what are you doing? Are you coming for great plunder, spoil, and booty? And remember, the merchants of Tarshish, not the athletes, the entertainers, the politicians, right. but the merchants, a commercial theme of Tarshish, are listed there and I believe the young lions would be us so I think if you get if the viewers get the book and DVD they're gonna understand America probably is there but if we're there and we're only protesting on the sidelines what happened we're yeah. the superpower country we seem to be greatly compromised in Ezekiel 38 and I think that we've had this discussion under the programs America is pretty much straight armed God out of our society not not recently but over 60 some years at this point exactly. we're taking prayer and Bibles out of the schools, the abortion 
Roe versus Wade, 1973, taking down the Ten Commandments, and these are all Supreme Court decisions. The, the 2013, uh, the America, the Supreme Court could not defend the constitutionality of marriage, the DOMA, Defense of Marriage Act. When you can't defend that, you open yourself up to redefining marriage. Of course, in Overvelt versus Hodges case in 2015, when Obama was president, uh, same-sex marriages got approved. And, and I think at this point, America is experiencing the abandonment and wrath spoken about in Romans chapter one. When, when God steps back, um, pretty much it's like, you know, all kinds of things can happen. People are given over to the lust of the flesh, homosexuality, depraved minds. That's all in Romans chapter one. Yeah. The return of the gods, as Jonathan Kahn has written about. Yeah. Uh, all this is being manifest right now. And, uh, you know, and I hear the echoing cries of the children of Israel that says, God is no longer going out with our armies, right? Yeah. And, and actually in Israel, too, they're trying to, Tel Aviv is trying to be the number one city with uh, sponsoring homosexuality. Uh, I've heard that before. So, I mean, you know, homosexuality is rampant throughout the world now. And once homosexuality comes into a country, uh, the, that country has never been able to get turned it away. And it usually leads to the demise of that country or that empire. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Bill, has there ever in your awareness of history where uh, homosexuality, once it's in, has it ever been vacated and a nation be been able to recover? I've not found that historically in all my research. Matter of fact, uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, was pretty much due to that very fact that sexual perversion, homosexuality, etc. And so um, I'm very concerned about the future of this country. I continue to want to point people toward the savior, not a political savior. Exactly. And that's why doing shows like this is very important, Bill. Well, Bill, uh, we're so grateful that uh, you have made the time, you know, to come on and, uh, you know, uh, talk about uh, and update us on these uh, future wars that are coming. Uh, there's no escaping this, right, Bill? I'm, I'm going to let you kind of wrap it up and give you about two and a half minutes in which to summarize everything, uh, remind people how they can be in touch with you and get uh, get their hands on your book that they would uh, they would increase in the right kind of knowledge that precedes the right kind of action that will honor God in the kingdom. Oh, awesome, exactly. You know, in Genesis 12, verse three, God said that he'd bless Abraham and he'd be a great nation. He goes on to say, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So God established his Gentile foreign policy over 4,000 years ago in Genesis exactly. chapter 12. He will curse those that curses Abraham's descendants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, on through to the Jews today. I've prayed for many years, Bill. When are you going to curse those countries around Israel that want to wipe Israel off the map that are oppressing Israel? And I feel a couple of years ago, I got a, a small voice in my ear that said, Bill, what kind of, how, what don't you understand that I'm a long suffering God? Yeah. But part of that, did you not understand is how it was phrased to me. And then I realized, hey, listen, we cannot move the prophetic calendar forward. It's on God's time frame, and God's time frame is enduring mercies, long suffering. But Bill, like you said, we cannot stop these prophecies from coming. They will come. God knew they would come. He, he's given us this information. And it, a lot of it I put into my book series, of course. Uh, so they're going to come, Bill. And I think they're going to come pretty soon. And when they do come, they will globally impact everyone. And Americans need to be prepared. So, for instance, let's say Israel strikes Iran. Iran has promised that they will shut down the Strait of Hormuz. That's not an idle threat. And about 23 25% of the world's oil and natural resources still come through that area right there. That will globally impact world economies. And that, that could happen tomorrow if Israel exactly. comes attacks Iran. So I'm, I, I like people to realize that we're, we're not no longer just talking about Bible prophecy because it's itching ears. It's kind of entertaining to know. We're talking about it because it's going to affect you. You need to know about it. These things are going to happen. The Middle East is going to go, go nuts. Cities are going to be destroyed. Countries are going to be warring with each other. Bigger wars than ever before. And then here comes Russia with its gang of troops. And then ultimately we get into the Armageddon scenario, the tribulation and all those, there's wars there too. And I get into all that inside the book. Um, and, and where's China in this, Bill? Well, China, we do believe would be in Revelation chapter 16 in the uh, sixth bowl judgment where it says the kings of the east 
we would say that probably be the Orient, are going to come across the river, a dried up river, river Euphrates at that time, part of the Sixth Bowl Jesuit. And they're coming to gather together for the Armageddon battle, the Armageddon campaign. And I do get into that in the book. Also, you showed a slide with my books on it. And yeah. I have, we, we put all those books and DVDs on this thumb drive. You see it on the slide there? Right. It's got my five books and five DVDs there. It's got four letters from me, instructions to those who could get left behind important this is uh for them to have so they can know what's coming because they need to know what's coming because exactly. judgments are going to happen the antichrist coming on the scene the martyrdom that's going to take place the strong delusion that's going to happen when satan's free to delude the world to get them to believe the lie and and so we have this thumb drive we re recommend it can help you right now to understand bible prophecies all the books and videos are on it but it's really you can leave it it's compact you can leave it for your loved one and remind them when you see them every time don't lose that. Look at it. But if you don't look at it because you feel like I'm Bible beating you, just save it because you're going to be looking at it when the time comes. Well, Bill, we got to wrap things up. So remind everybody the website they can go to in order to connect with you and to uh, get their hands on these important books. Yes, Bill. And thank you so much for being on the program. It's always good to be with you, my friend. Yeah. Uh, my website is prophecydepot.com, prophecydepot, like Home Depot.com. And I've got all kinds of articles, TV shows, media shows I've been on. Uh, all, we've got an online product store with all the products. So okay. I would invite you to visit prophecydepot.com. You got it. Our thanks to Bill Salas for being with us today. For more information and to be a part of this mighty Martinez movement to return to God and to save our country, go to billmartinezshow.com. May God bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you and give you peace. Go and be blessed to be a blessing. Thanks for being with us. Take care.